Jim, just describe, uh, briefly describe the founding of Union Bridge. Union Bridge was founded in the 1800s by the Farquhar family, and they came from out of Pennsylvania. Uh, of course, they came, most people came originally from Germany. They were Pennsylvania Dutch Germans. Uh, but the Farquhars came here, uh, and he and his wife and their children, and they, they established residency. And then they started to, he started to divide up his property among his children. Uh, and then his children started to bring industry to the town. Uh, his one son, Benjamin, I think brought an a oil mill and a sawmill to town. So the town grew slowly, but it was different people who were here, but the Farquhars are basically the ones who settled Union Bridge. And so Union Bridge basically became very uh, heavily Quaker population? It was, it was a large Quaker community, and, and basically it was, I, I've always heard it called the Pipe Creek Settlement. Um, and so this, the Pipe Creek Settlement was the Quakers that were here. Um, matter of fact, the Roosevelt family, I think, visited the Quaker Meeting House that's here uh, on the outside of town on the hill, Quaker Hill which, matter of fact, that's the name of the road, so <laughs> it's very uh, apropos. Um, and then just tell a little bit, describe a little bit the, uh, the meeting house. The Quaker Meeting House was built in 1764, and then it was a log building, and then it burned, and then in 1771, they rebuilt the Quaker Meeting House out of brick and, and, and wood. I also thought it was very nice that you're still holding a service there. Yes, we're, we're very fortunate, and, and you know, as growing up here as a kid, I've been here 55 years, except for going to college and moving away for about two years. Uh, it's been interesting to, to know that, the, you know, as a kid, the Quaker meeting, it was always, to us, a kind of a secretive people, you know, up there. We always used to look, look at the, oh, it's a Quaker meeting house, because we never really understood, you know. They were one religion, and we were all different religions. And, uh, but I can remember that through the years, I was always worried that it would die out. And the revival of the place is, is getting more and more. Uh, they've got more people that have been moving in the area that are Quaker or that are joining who have found that they like the Quaker life um, and beliefs. And so I, in my heart, I'm glad to know that it just didn't, you know, die out and, and like, you know, the Shakers, you know, they've, they've kind of disappeared off the face of the earth. But the Quakers still meet there. And I know that last year they had a, a bell ringing service there and they ended up having 60 people. So for a small little building, that's, that says a lot. And I think it's good to preserve the history. Um, because Union Bridge was very Quaker and they were anti-slavery, uh, were there slaves and or were there free blacks in the community? A little bit of both. I think there were some slaves and I think there were people who may have had slaves but didn't treat them as slaves. I think that they, um, you know, because the Quakers were anti-slavery, uh, and, and I know that that, you know, that might have been the situation that would occurred. And with us being, even though we're in the north, we're kind of to the south. You know, I think we've always, you know, people always said to me, uh, you're, you're from the north, you're, you know, you're a northerner. Well, I always kind of felt it we were a little southern. And people who used to meet me say, I thought you were from the south. And I said, no, I'm from Union Bridge, which is the north, but in Maryland. But, you know, again, I think, I think you had a little bit of both influences. You had some who probably did keep people that were slaves and treated them as such. But I also think you had people that had slaves and may appear to have had them as slaves, but treated them more like a family. Um, did they, were they an inter integral part of the community, the free blacks perhaps, or did they have their own little... Well, you know, it, when I can remember back as a, a kid, because we're going back, you know, 50-some years now, <laughs> I don't like that part of it. Um, I can remember growing up here that, you know, being such a small community, the blacks weren't different. For as far as I was concerned, and, and a lot of people, because we grew up, and it was a small amount of black families, but they had sm their small communities. You had small communities outside of town, like Priestland uh, was a, a black community. And then out into Bark Hill, from what I was told from my mother and my grandparents years ago, that was a lot of black people that lived in that area because they, they built their little homes, and, and there was a lot of log houses in Bark Hill. So basically, from what I've been told and what I've read, Bark Hill was at one time quite a large population of, of blacks. Uh, matter of fact, I own a piece of property out there that uh, I was told that there was a, a slave who was freed, and he settled there, and he built his little farm there. Um, and the barn still stands. The house burned down, but I still have the barn. And so again, you know, they were prosperous, and they were free at that point. Just briefly describe it, and you can do it from, you know, from your view of growing up. Um, agrarian roots, very much an agricultural community? 
Yeah, Union Bridge back in the, you know, of course, when you look, when I look at Union Bridge today and people come through here, they don't, it's totally different because it's so long ago. But out by the bridge, uh, just below Stanball's uh, hardware and rental, that was a swamp land. So there was the Pipe Creek, but then there was a lot of swamp. So, uh, you know, it's totally different today. That's all been drained. And, but they would come in and they would take the parcels of land and they would drain the water off and, you know, build and, and, and build up the ground. And the soil is so good because of, of it being the dark, rich soil. Uh, so there, there was a lot of farming that, that commenced. Uh, I think as, as time went on, they, they developed more and more because the need grew. When the, you know, the population grew here, they needed more wheat and flowers you know, from the wheat. They needed more uh, corn. And, and those kind of things. So I think that you saw that grow. And then of course there was were cattle and there was lots of milk. Uh, and then there was were beef and there were sheep. And and even though back, you know, there was always that thing about the, the cattlemen and the sheep people don't get along. Back in those days it was harmony. Uh, because you used all those things. You know, you used the wool for clothing, you used the meat, uh, then you used the milk from the cattle. So there was lots of things that were here. My grandmother Rao was a wonderful woman country woman, you know, she raised her own chickens, they killed the chickens, we, you know, and I never remember doing wash day at her place, we used to heat the water up in big kettles outside, and then you wash the clothes, you know, with the water, that was not a fun time. But my grandparents, Stanball, that lived outside of town, uh, William and, and Ethel, they were wonderful, and they, they, I mean, my grandmother made everything, I mean, you jarred everything, you made jellies, you know, you didn't go to a store and buy things. You produced it yourself. And then in the root cellar, you had potatoes. And then my grandfather, I remember, he used to go out and dig holes in the ground and bury things in the, in the fall that you'd go out and get in the wintertime, you know, like different root vegetables, turnips, and, and those things. So, you know, that was, what, that was a way of life. You know, we didn't have grocery stores. You know, it's interesting. I, we now have uh, 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 several, I guess it's about, what, six to seven little great nieces and nephews, and we're, they're just young now, and we're trying to get them to come to our house because we have chickens, and I want them to see that eggs come from a chicken, and, and the chicken sits in a little box in a chicken house. You don't go to the store and get them off the shelf. You know, th that's the things I think that are important to remember, that things are so different today, and we take for granted, but we, got, we can't forget where we came from from the past. And I think that's what's happening in our country. We're so busy trying to survive and move on and, and all the things around us that people forget where things came from and how we lived back then. And some people do still can today. You know, I mean, if I wasn't so busy in my life, I, I canned for years when I was a nurse at a hospital. And people used to say to me, you're going home and do what? And I'm going home and snip green beans and put up 30 to 40, 50 quarts of green beans a year. What do you do with those? Well, Thanksgiving, you have family, you take your own green beans. I mean, those are the things that, that I'm glad that, that we still see some of, but we don't see it as much as we used to. But I think that's going to change, because I think people are realizing they, these little victory gardens are starting to spring up again. It, at some point, there was a, uh, people began, because they were growing so much, they had a surplus. And so we, it, things somewhat shifted so that um, the agricultural products became more of a business of retail and wholesale selling. Right. Well, that, that was interesting, because you know, when we bought this building, I knew of the history from my childhood, but I didn't know how far back. And it was an Engler store, and then George Cox, a descendant of King George, bought the place. And that's when uh, I think Buttersburg came into play because he would take in so much of the butter and the milk and the cream and the products and the honey that the Quakers were, were producing because there was such an abundance. And he was doing it, selling it, and they would do a barter where you know they would bring in stuff and they would get their products from him. Uh, flour, sugar, whatever, and exchange. And then he opened a huckster's route because he had so much of those good things, fresh brown eggs, and white eggs, whatever they had. Uh, but, you know, and then, so then it was nicknamed Buttertown, and then it became Buttersburg. Um, and it's funny because growing up, I, I didn't hear about that too much. You know, we used to come to town to all the stores, and this was a booming little town. I mean, we had lots of stores. And on a Friday and Saturday night, this was a hot spot, and you wouldn't be able to find a place outside. So those things have changed, but, but those are part of our lives, and it's important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What, what were some of the uh, first mills that were used? We had the sawmill. We had the woolen mills. And, and I know that uh, Mr. Farquhar's son had an oil mill. I'm not sure exactly what that entailed, um, but we had lots of sawmills. And as you look around our, our uh, room at the restaurant, you'll see a lot of flower bags from different mills that were in the area. I mean, we had a, a, in neighboring areas like Middleburg and Krauss Mill 
uh, was one. And then, of course, Otterdale Mill, which is just outside of town here, was another place. And uh, matter of fact, that was uh, a cold storage place for a long time, a locker plant, up until the Durr family uh, sold it uh, many years ago. But that, that was part of it. You know, you would have places to keep things frozen because the water would, would generate the, the uh, freezer and then also they would make their wheat flour. So it, it was a lot that went on and around the area. There was a lot of, a lot of mills outside of town, Roop's Mill, I, I mean, out of uh, McKinstry's Mill. So there's a lot of mills. Some are still standing, some are in bad shape, some are still in good shape. Uh, I'd like to see people maybe renovate them and turn them into something, maybe even just antique shops. Uh, but you know, they, they were part of our history. They were everywhere you turned, you found power because there was so much water in the area. Yeah, Jacob Thomas in 1811, he uh, designed and built a, a, our first reaping machine in the country. And, and down just right across from us at the restaurant is the building. It's now the Union Bridge, uh, well, it's PNC Bank. But back way back, it was uh, Union Bridge Bank. And that, but on that site in the building there, he designed and built this reaping machine. And then right outside of town at Mount Pleasant, which is the Mary Clemson farm, uh, they, that is where he, if you go out the, uh, Buker John Road, you'll see a sign where he tested it in the field there. It must have been really exciting for this town, for the people, to know that one of their own built a machine that can do what people had to do by hand. And I mean, back then, it, it just it must have been really exciting to know that, you know, here, here's one of the people from the town. And, and, you know, that's why I said when people talk to me about Union Bridge, I always tell them, we're a small town with a big history. And I think that's what people forget. They ride by and they see things like you know, dust and dirt and this and that, and, and they don't realize that there was so much rich, rich history here. And I think that's the problem with, with what I see in our country today. We're so involved in so many things, we seem to tend to forget our history. And I'm not so sure we're teaching the young people what they should really know about their, the, the areas they live in and where we come from. And I think that's something I, I hate to see die. Talk about Buttersburg, but describe how the town actually received its current name in 1820. Well, back uh, before 1820, or around 1820, they're out over the, the river and, of course, the swamp area, uh, the town people and the city people, or the town people and the country people, excuse me, uh, they decide they would build a bridge. So they worked together. And once they got the bridge built, they decided, what are we going to call it? And they said, well, because we all came together, it was a union. Of, of the town and the, and the, and the, the rural people. So the, the bridge became Union Bridge. And then in 1800s, later in the 1800s, the post office came to town because we had rural free delivery that started in Westminster, which was a great thing for everybody. And I'm sure that was another exciting event that you, you know, you could, the mail could be delivered right to you. You didn't have to drive into certain places. So when the post office came to town, which was in a building house across the street from us, um, they decided, the, the Postal Service decided, well, they would just adopt the name Union Bridge. And that's nothing wrong with the name, but I like, I like Butter, Buttersburg. I think it just tells you a little bit more about the history. Um, in 1855, uh, just describe briefly just the arrival of the railroad and how um, it affected the town. The coming of the railroad to Union Bridge was a big thing because before that, people had to take their things to, you know, that's the closest town from us was Westminster. Uh, and of course, you know, so back at least part of it, I'm not sure exactly what all was there, but we would had to go that, that distance. So that's a long travel. But when the railroad came, well, the farmers could take their milk right to the town, down to, to the railroad station. And of course, they had different depots for, you know, things to be shipped out. So they would bring their, their milk and that improved so much of what they could, could ship because they could sell things now, not just locally, but they could sell it outside of the area, and things could be brought in. So it was a big boom, because you know, here's this industry coming to town. They had to build housing for the railroad people, and so then they had to build housing uh, for the railroad cars, a shop to work on those things. Matter of fact, my father used to work for the Western Maryland Railroad when I was a kid, and um, he worked, he was a box part, car painter. And we used to go down there when I was a kid. I can remember some of the shops. It was a big place, but back, way back in the old days, there was a, a tremendous fire there that destroyed most of the railroad. And they built back things, but it wasn't the same. But the, but the coming of the railroad was a big, big excitement for the town because after all, people could now travel. We could get on the train and go visit people in Westminster, or you could go shopping. And you didn't have to worry about getting in a horse and buggy or an old car to run all the way down. You could just get on the train. So people were back and forth, and it was a hustle and a bustle. 
Matter of fact, I found uh, someone brought to me uh, uh, an old uh, store placard from a store, a sales slip from the Ingalls store up the street here. And on the back, the lady had done a handwritten ad about her hotel at the Union Bridge Hotel. She had uh, working electric lights and steam heat and baths and a livery stable and the price was on there, a very a minor price. So it must have been an ad she was writing to have put in the paper. Well, someone found it in the closet when they were cleaning up their parents' stuff that had passed away, and they brought it to us. And she said, would you like to have this? And I said, oh, absolutely. So I gave it to a friend of ours who was the former doctor here, and he's going to frame it for me, which he does a lot of the things on the wall uh, Dr. Karakouf has done for us. Uh, that's part of a hobby. He doesn't do it for everybody, but we kind of do an exchange. He uh, takes some of the pictures and he copies them for himself, and then he frames it, and I cover the cost of the framing. So it works out. He gets history and I, to preserve, and I get some history. You get a nice barter. Yes. Um, so there was the freight train, and then uh, later there was a passenger train. But what was the purpose or the need to have a separate freight depot and a separate? Well, I, I think that, you know, when you have freight, there was lots of freight come in. So, you know, there was probably there were animals that were shipped from here, I'm sure, pigs, chickens. I'm sure there was even some steers. And, of course, beef was probably sent to be sold elsewhere. So you didn't want to have people in the same areas. And then, of course, there was a pr produce section, uh, that uh, depot for produce. So I'm sure that there were so much things being brought in. Back in those days, to us, it was, you know, to us today, when we go somewhere and see a big tractor trailer load, that's tremendous. But if you saw a small wagon load, that was tremendous back in those days, that these people were able to produce that much and be able to sell it and have money to survive. Um, and then eventually the railroad reached Hagerstown and then they moved to headquarters. What happened to the town? Yeah, the, the, when the railroad moved to Hagerstown, uh, the town of Union Bridge kind of went down to a slump because all the hustle and bustle and the, you know, the main offices weren't here. But we still had the freight trains. We still had the passenger trains. Uh, we still had people coming and going. Uh, people traveling back and forth. So in a way, it was nice because people could travel to Hagerstown, but at the same time, it took away from the town some of the main industry that was here uh, as part of the railroad that was here because they moved the main office. What, what was the, or I guess, why was the last regular train in 1957? Uh, because passengers, you know, people, the, the automobile became more popular. People didn't want to wait for the train. The train took longer than what it would be to get here from a car because they would stop in each little town. Because behind us or beyond us were many little towns like New Windsor and then there was Medford which was a big bustling little shopping area that had many, many stores right on the railroad track. So that was a nice thing. You could go back and forth and you go into Westminster and then you, you know, go further down into Baltimore and so forth. I can remember people talking about when they used to get the train as children with their parents and ride to Baltimore. That was a big thing back then. So, but uh, times change, things change. I know when uh, my father worked for the railroad, we were kids, and when they were closing down the shops, they were going to transfer him to West Virginia, and we just, my sister and brother and I, we just didn't want to go. We, we begged him not to go, so then he became unemployed for a while because he gave up the job at the railroad and, and retired early from Western Maryland because, you know, we just didn't want to go. Originally, West Virginia might be a nice place, but we didn't want to leave our area because we had all our friends here and we wanted to finish school here. So when the railroads really changed their shops, that's when things changed. Um, just kind of backing up a little bit, and I, I don't know any stories passed down from your grandparents or great-grandparents about the uh, feeling of the folks here in Union Bridge when, the, when it became a county. Well, you know, it, they were country folks. I mean, I'm sure they were excited, but they were, they were just happy for what they had. I mean, you know, this wasn't the, the wealthiest place in the world, but what people had w w was much more sometimes than what they have today, which is the substance and, and the, the uh, closeness and knit of the family. Um, but I, I think that it wasn't, you know, they were excited. I'm sure there was were, were celebration. But they never talked too much about that. You know, basically, they just talked about what was going on here in the community itself. Um, uh, what was the involvement of Union Bridge during the Civil War? You know, my, I, it's, it's funny because uh, where we own our little farm, uh, there's a meadow in the back, and it's cleared, but it's surrounded by woods. And we've had people come over and, and look for things and, and uh, found buttons, Civil War buttons, and bullets and, and things like that. And I can remember my grandfather talking about troops used to come through, and even in their meadow, they camped there uh, in his meadow on Bark Hill Road and talked about, you know, that, you know, this is what it was told to him, that this is what went on, because on their way to Westminster, you know, from around, of course, we're in between. But I think the one thing about our railroad 
is that back in the Civil War when people were, were shot, uh, some of the people were brought to Union Bridge in the late of night, some of their officers packed in ice at the railroad station and then shipped to Baltimore to be, to be given back to their families. So that's something that's different and unique. But if you look around the area, there are, now they have the Civil War, War plaques of what each area was, you know, was a part of. And I think that's an excellent thing that, that's been done. I think the more we, we post history, keep it out there, the better we are. There are, there are stories of underground railroad sites um, that people were transported back and forth, different places, different farmhouses had places that they hid them in the basements and so forth. Um, so I'm sure that, that you know, there was a railroad here, um, exactly where, and there's probably people older than me that knew that and they might be able to still remember, and some of those have probably passed on. But um, I'm sure the Quakers were very instrumental in helping the people who wanted to, to move on especially people who could make it from the south to here. Um, Post-Civil War, uh, just to kind of describe the town, after the war when soldiers were coming back, going back to their business or their farms, uh, just kind of new industries and just in general kind of the, the growth, uh, more diversified industries. I, I think when they came back, those that came back um, and that weren't wounded so severely, came back to their homes and started back up their businesses and started doing things. I think we saw more entrepreneurs coming in, you know, doing certain things with, with uh, you know, shoemakers and, and those kind of things, harness makers. Uh, I think they probably came back and picked up blacksmiths. I mean, they were, th th there was a lot going on back in those days. So I think they just came back and some of them, I think, came back and, and from what I remember stories being told, some of them didn't come back mentally in one piece. So there was some who, who were unable to function. As we see today in all of our war soldiers that return, our veterans, we, we see some that, that come back with tra tra traumatic experiences that, that are there to uh, interfere with what they can do with their lives, which is sad. Was, was there still a com uh, connection or camaraderie between farmers and merchants? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think that, that that's a big part that kept the town going was because you had people here that were all, you know, intertwined and, and worked together well. Well, the, the, from what I can remember now, I, the paper I remember the most was the pilot. But the people's voice, I can remember my grandparents talking about. And it was a newspaper that kept everybody informed what was happening around the community and outside our community. Uh, but like I said, the biggest paper I can remember as a child is the pilot. And it was interesting because you could open it up, and I have some copies that were given to me of when you could read like the local local events, and they would talk about you know William E. and Ethel Stambaugh uh, entertained her mother and st and father at a dinner on at the farm on Bark Hill Road on Saturday night, or when there was a bad car accident and people were killed back in that time, that they, that was in the paper, and it was always information, and people would write from the little communities like Feesersburg outside of here close to Middlesburg, Middleburg, which no longer has signs, uh, there would be something about that little town. So the papers kept everybody informed what was happening. And it wasn't a gossip paper. It was just talking about what went on. You know, when somebody died, and it was, they talked about it, and, and, and the, that they would have the quake at the, at the uh, family's home. You know, when I grew up on Bark Hill Road as a kid where we grew up, uh, the people that had it before my father bought the house, when Mr. and Mrs. Jackson died, they had them in the house and you kept them there all night and people came and sat with them and the funeral was done there. We didn't have an undertaker where you went into the funeral home. And I think there's a lot of houses around here that that happened to. I think some people who don't like to think about ghosts and so forth may not like the fact that somebody laid in their living room for a couple of days, but uh, you know, those were the times. And we, and we still see that happening. There are some families here that have still had their family members at, at home because that's been a tradition. And I think that's fine if that's what they want to do. You know, I'm not sure where I want to be laid out, but... <laughs> Just uh, briefly a little bit about the, the house uh, or Union Bridge being the first uh, town to have uh, electric light. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly the date of that, but it was back, we were the first town to have electric lights. And that was exciting for Union Bridge. Uh, to be such a small town and to be able to have that, uh, that opportunity. Just briefly talk a little bit about uh, William Reinhardt. William Reinhardt grew up outside of town on Marble Quarry Road on the Marble Quarry Farm, uh, which his family had. Um, and he got into carving limestone. Of course, there's a lot of limestone here and marble. 
And so he became, he started doing some sculpturing work and then he got involved with the Walters family from the Walters Art Gallery. And he you know, went off to school and, and he became one of the greatest uh, sculptures and, uh, sculptors. And uh, you can see his works around ba Baltimore over at um, uh, Greenmount Cemetery. He did a lot of things for the Walters family. Of course, he did the uh, statue that we have a copy of at the town square uh, for Mrs. Walters' grave. Um, and then there were things that you know had, had been told to me by people that he you know did a lot of things here, uh, but then he went to Rome and, and did many things over there and died in Rome. But um, he even did carvings of some doors. I think it was the is it the U.S. Congress or something in D.C. where he had did the carvings of the doors. So I mean his you know, I think it, it's kind of sad because growing up here we never really talked about him much even in our history classes or anything. But now, as we got older, we started talking about him. And then, when you know the monument was going to come to town, it was—I did a little more looking into it. And of course, we had people here that were working hard on that. And it's amazing just how good of things or great of things he did. And very little did we ever think about that we had somebody so famous come from Little Union Bridge. So it's something for us all to be proud of. The post office before we were RFD. Um, it was uh, kind of a social place. People would come in, uh, they'd, they'd go to merchants, they'd buy things, or they'd see their neighbors or whatever. And then the real freak, you know, kind of went right to your door so people didn't come in and maybe as often. Right. Kind of yeah, I, I think when, when the rural free delivery came in, it did change because people did come in to town to get their mail, and they may, may only make a trip in once a week. They may come in twice a week, um, and they would come to the post office. So when people would meet for their mail, people would discuss things, and that would be kind of a social area to meet and, and find out what's going on in their little communities. Because, like I said, there's a lot of little communities here that are still here. Some of the signs may not, may be down on the longest the road, but they're still here. I mean, you had you know, then, of course, you had Linwood and you had Uniontown, and so people would come and go to the small little towns. Um, which, which I think was interesting that you had this social gathering. And then when the delivery came in, people didn't have a need to come to town all the time. You know, they may, may come in and get their groceries once a month because, again, as I said, people grew what they needed on their own properties. They may come to town more in the wintertime, um, but not as much maybe in the summertime because they were busy doing their, their crops and harvesting and growing their vegetables. But the post office was an important part of the town. Yeah, Tidewater Portland Cement came in, and that started the ball rolling. Um, and, and then, of course, they started to, to produce cement. And then uh, that, that gave business to the town, and that brought people for work. Uh, the, the cement company has been a, a very important part of our town, uh, the history and, and the fact of employment. And like you said, as the railroad died out, then you had the, the cement plant, which helped tremendously as far as employment. And then, of course, the Tidewater was purchased by... Uh, Lehigh Portland Cement back in 19, uh, I think it was about 25, 24, 25. And then it, that became Lehigh Portland Cement Company. And then, of course, it, it's been growing and growing. And then, of course, over time, you, you change, you find new methods of, of work, you, you uh, change the kind of equipment you use. The technology of today is nothing what they did back in the old days. I mean, they went down and chipped away and broke up rock and all that. Now they have all this technology that you can do things you know, with computers and so forth. And today, it, it is owned by a German company, and it's Heidelberg, but it's Lehigh Portland Cement. Um, and the, the, they, have, they have increased what they have there, but the technology has changed, so they don't need as many as employees as they had way back, but they still are a large employer. And they're a good neighbor. They're a good neighbor for the town. Lehigh is a good, is a good, is a good group of people. Uh, it's very beneficial to the town. Uh, it provides us with, with, with uh, you know, substance here. People have to have jobs, and, and a lot of the men that have worked there for, forever and ever, a lot of my family worked there. A lot of my uh, past family have worked there. Uh, so it's, you know, I have a nephew that works there. Uh, I have cousins that work there. So there's many people, and many of our customers work there. But it's, it's been a very important part of our community. And, I, you know, we're lucky to have a, a neighbor like Lehigh. They do a lot of support, and you know, I, I think you know, as we see things growing, sometimes you hear things that people are unhappy because of, uh, they're increasing their size and they're they're going to start shipping things and this and that from another quarry. Uh, but they're looking at ways to do it 
that not just that will be cumbersome to the community. You know, people are worried about the truck traffic that it would bring, but they're looking at other alternatives. But then there are people out there who don't like those alternatives. So you're never going to make everybody happy. But we have to look at the fact that Lehigh is here. It's an important part of us. Uh, we need industry. Uh, they need people. We need them. Uh, and I think that, you know, we need to look at all that because Lehigh has, has provided for a lot of community outreach. They've done a lot of donating for, for things in the community, not just in Union Bridge, but in, in the county itself. So I, I, I think we're lucky. I mean, like I said, you're never going to please everybody. And there's always going to be people on both sides. You know, I am for some things and I'm against some things. And some things that I may be against, I may change my mind later. You know, as we get older, we seem to mellow and we change. But I think that it's important to realize that there are changes and, and, and industry has to grow and things have to change. But we need to work with them to make sure they change in the less intrusive way. That's, that's the concern I have. Um, how did the Great Depression affect you? Yeah, you know, back when the, the Depression came, uh, from what I heard from my grandparents, and, 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 and I had a, a great aunt that lived across the street from us, she used to have, when I was older, as a teenager, even younger, I used to go over and she used to go up on the attic and get sugar. And I always wondered, where did the sugar come from? So I said to her one time, I said, Aunt Edna, where are you getting this sugar? I had it stored in the attic from the Depression. And this was back in the, the late 50s, early 60s, and I'm thinking, the Depression. So, well, back then, you were given coupons, and you were rationed, so we saved. And she had lard cans with sugar and flour and milk in her attic. So I was like, and, and you know, it's, it's funny, you look at that and you think, oh, you know, that's crazy. But it wasn't crazy, because back in those days, you didn't get it. And when you ran out, you did without it. And so they tried to make it last. But, you know, the Depression came to town, and people here were lucky because they had space to grow food and to, you know, keep a couple of chickens, you know, maybe a milk cow or so. And if you look around the town, even the town today, a lot of the older homes, and they're beautiful homes here, they have backyards that are pretty large or little places that were probably most likely used for garden plots because people raised their own food. So I think the Depression here, it was hard, but I don't think it was hard as other areas in larger places because people here worked hard and, and people did without and they made use of things. You know, I can remember my grandmother, uh, Rao, used to work for the cement company, the Tybor company, and she sewed cement bags. They were cloth and she would sew cement bags to be able to provide for my, bro my father's brothers and sisters because my grandfather died young and left her with six children to raise. Pe people did whatever they could do to, to survive and they did as we are today. <laughs> um, World War II, uh, just a little bit about um, the roots, uh, Olive and Roger and their heifer relief. Well, you know, Miss Olive is going to be turning, uh, I think, what did I see in the paper, 95, uh, coming up soon. Uh, and, I've, and I'm lucky, I knew Olive and Mr. Rupp and uh, uh, known them all my life. And good people, good, wonderful people. And they started a project on their farm, and it was where they would take heifers and they would ship them over to other countries so that the people could, could own a, a cow, and that cow could give them substance, which would be milk. And then it would be bread, and it would give them an offspring. And then they would take that, if it was a heifer, they would give it to another person. If it was a bull cow, they usually would probably take it and use it for food. So that was something that, that started out from the roofs, and they brought in all these cattle and would be taking care of them on their farm so they could do that. Uh, they were from the Church of the Brethren, uh, and uh, so that was part of their, their, their life and what they wanted to do. But they were good people, and they did a great service. And, but the Heifer Project is still alive and going well, and now they do other things. They have goats and pigs and other things that they are sending off to these countries where people are less fortunate so that they can grow their own food, which I think is a wonderful thing. I think that when we go, can go into a country and teach them the way to grow more food better and, and, and easier than what they're struggling to do, that's a great thing. You know, as they used to say, take the weapons and beat them into plowshares. That's the thing that the Rup stood for. They were uh, people who were not, uh, they didn't believe in, in, in wars. Uh, they believed in taking care of people and, and, and they were good people. So the Heifer Project was from here. So, and just right outside, it's not that far from here. And the farm still stands today. And one of my classmates from high school, she lives there. Her family's been there for, uh, for two generations. So it's, it, was, it was nice to be able to know that, that the Rooks were a part of that and that that legacy is still there and that their children and their grandchildren 
and great grandchildren can look back and say that you know Olive and John Ripple were good people. They really did a good thing. Yeah, and and back when the, the Heifer Project started, uh, this was after the war in, in Europe, uh, war tour in Europe. Uh, and of course, then they became. You know, they talked about the sea cowboys because they would take these large amounts over, and, and by, of course, you had to take them by boat uh, over there. Um, and so that was a part of that. And so that Heifer Relief is now Heifer International, which is a large program. So, it, it, like I said to you, that it's not just the heifers now; it's other animals that we've added to that. But it's it's still going strong. But it's a part, an important part of our history. Um, how did the uh, civil rights era affect Union Bridge? You know, growing up here, <laughs> for me, I never saw much of a difference between the black community and the white community. Maybe because we grew up together, you know, and, and was part of our families. Um, I can remember my grandparents having uh, black people who would come there to help out uh, during harvest, and, and we had a neighbor up the road that. I used to go and, and we would hang out and I can remember him working for different farms and, and uh, I looked up to him because he was older. Um, but um, and that was uh, you know, Mr. Thomas and, and so the, there, was, there was a lot of uh, people here. I, I, don't, I don't remember us having a problem. You know, I'm sure back, way back, they were separate eating places. They couldn't come in and eat in places that we did. But by the time I got older, that seemed to change. And in school, we were all together because we were from a small town. And we had small schools, um, and we didn't have all the influence that you see in other places. And so I, I, I don't think that we saw the, the things that we saw in the South. I think that that was a whole different situation. How has Union Bridge managed to control growth and to sort of really remain a close-knit community? Well, I, I think that Union Bridge is one of the last small towns to, to grow, and I think we're going to grow. I mean, there's no doubt about it. We have two developments on both sides of the area here that have been incorporated to the town. I think that Jackson Ridge will probably be online before the villages of Union Bridge um, because they're further along in it. Um, so that I, I see that coming. But I think what's the hold up now is is the economy. Nobody wants to come in and start building houses if there's going to be nobody to buy the houses. It'd be nice if we could start building the houses so that people would have jobs. But again, and, and you know, being here all my life, I don't want to see us grow fast. But we, but I know in my heart, and I used to be one of those people who used to go to the town meetings 20 years ago and try to fight any development that came in. But I know that at 55 years of age, that, I, that has to change. In order to survive, we have to change because the town can't keep paying for services off of the same amount of people because things are going up. Our, our water treatment center uh, for the water here has gone, gotten more expensive. The products to do that with have gotten more expensive. So the town people are the ones who are paying for it. So the more people coming online, the better off that would be. However, I don't want to see you know thousands of people move in, in in a week or two. But over the time, over the years, every year or so, we could build here and there. That wouldn't be a problem and bring in people. You know, you need new blood, and 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 we need the, the changes. But I think that the changes are going to come. I think we're going to see more industry, not big industry because we don't have the property for that. Uh, but I think that, that things are going to change. Drastically, I don't see that happening. But over time, I see it changing. And I think that's, that's better. I think that we do need growth and, and we welcome people to move in. But you know, we, I think we'll stay a closed-knit community because we always have been. And we have you know, a volunteer fire department that is very important to our community and they do a fantastic job. So we have organizations, we have the Lions Club who does a great job. So I think that you know, we're going to see that things are changing, but I think that, that we can have good change as long as we plan properly and that's the thing that needs to be done. Making sure that things are in place, that we have the infrastructure to be able to handle the growth and that's important. You call Union Bridge a diamond in the rough. Can you just add like a sentence in? Yeah, I refer to Union Bridge as a diamond in the rough because it is a jewel, you know. When I was younger, I didn't like Union Bridge. Of course, we lived right outside of Union Bridge. Union Bridge was like, ah, oh, it's a cement town, it's dusty, it's this and that. And I was from the rural community. My grandparents were farmers. So I, I didn't want to live in a town. But as I got older, I appreciated it. And now that I'm older, I really appreciate it for the fact, not just because I own a business here, but because it is my roots and my family's here and my family's been here. Um, and I, and I, I just think that, that it is 
a town that a lot of times people overlook. You know, there's too many unions. We have Union Town, Union Mills, Unionville, and then there's Poor Little Union Bridge. And when I talk to people where we are located, they'll say, oh yeah, I passed that going to Silver Run. No, 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 no. That's not Union Bridge. That's Union Mills. So I think Union Bridge sometimes gets, gets put on the back burner. And I'll say this, that politically, I think we get put on the back burner many times because people come out here during election year, but when there is no election, we don't see them as often. And I think that's a problem I have. You know, if you're going to take care of me, you take care of me all the time, 365 days out of the year. Don't come out before elections. Now, we, we did have a county commissioner from here, Perry Jones, that is no longer commissioner at this point, and he did represent us. And I felt good about that because I felt, gee, finally, after all these years, Union Bridge has a voice. And he didn't just do things for Union Bridge. He did things for the whole county, but it was nice to have somebody from our hometown uh, because I look, I look for that. You know, our politicians need to realize that they're here to represent everybody. So when you're representing the county, you should be representing all parts of the county. And I'm not saying we should get anything any different than any other small town. But I think that Union Bridge has always been overlooked. And I, I think we're a diamond in the rough. I think there's a lot here. And as I've said before, we're a small town with a big history. And I think if people look at that history, it is so interesting to come out here and just see the walking tour brochure that we have from the Heritage Committee and many businesses donated to make that possible and grants. That is an interesting thing. You know, we never had that. And we, we give out tons of those at the restaurant. And that is something that's very interesting. People need to look at that. I bet you there are people in this town that don't even know that exists. And they ought to stop by anywhere in town, the store, general store next door. I don't know if they, I think Angelo may have some. They're all around. And pick up one of those walking tour brochures and read about our town because there's a lot of history here. And believe me, I have people who come to me all the time giving me books on the history of Union Bridge that they've put together over the years or they've done research. And I've got about this many of them in, in the office stuck in different places. And it, the, the town is just amazing of the stories and the history. And I, I wouldn't even have the time. If I gave you everything, we'd be here for a month to go over this. And we don't have that kind of time. But it is. To me, it's a diamond in the rough. And we have new sidewalks. Uh, things, new street lights. I think things are getting better. Uh, people used to talk about it being dusty. The dust that's in the town is much less from Lehigh. I think we see a lot of it from the truck traffic. That eventually will change because there'll be some reroutings of roads. Uh, but I think in the future, we need to look at that. You know, we need to, to make sure that, that the government keeps up with, with what needs to be done for these small towns. But I, I'm, I'm proud of Union Bridge. <laughs> and when I think about that, it makes me kind of laugh because when I was a kid, my whole attitude was different. But as I've gotten older, I guess maybe when you get older, you cling to things that are from your past. And my family were from here, and, and family means a lot. And my grandparents, like I said, they were, they were wonderful, good people. And I used to come to town with my grandfather. He would throw ear corn on the truck, and we'd come to, down to the old feed mill, and he would unload it and grind the feed, and I'd sit there on a feed bag, and I'd talk to Mrs. Baltzell, Thelma Baltzell, who still lives outside of town, and she worked at the, at the desk. And, and I remember she used to be such a sweet lady there, and, and uh, I would sit there and wait for my grandfather to get the feed mixed, and then they'd load the truck with, with the feed, and then we'd take it back to the farm, and we'd unload it, and he'd feed his dairy cows and pigs and chickens. And so I looked forward to that. Whenever Pappy said he was going to town, any of us grandchildren there, we wanted to go along because you usually got a little Coke in a bottle, just a small one. And he would maybe sometimes, if you're lucky, you'd get a candy bar. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been a nice, nice experience. And I can say that I'm proud to be from Union Bridge. And, and, and it's funny because my, my mother, uh, Thelma Stanball Rao, she worked when she graduated from high school at the bank. And then she left there, and years later, she um, came to work for the town doctor, Dr. Thomas H. Legg. Dr. Legg was a phenomenal man, big guy, and a little scary when you were a kid, but he was a sweet man. And she worked for him, so she would bring me into town a lot, and we'd come in different times, and I would come into the, so the soda fountain and, and, and different stores, and, and John Leitner had the barber shop here on the corner, and I'd go there, and <laughs> I can remember when I used to first come as a little kid, and they put that bar across the seat. My father would sit me there. I'd scream and cry for a while, but you got used to it after a while. The, the shears didn't seem to hurt you. You know, you thought they were going to cut off your ears. But I'd come to the soda fountain over here, and we'd sit there, and we'd get burgers and Cokes, and I loved the fountain Cokes. The fountain Cokes were wonderful. And then, you know, as growing up, it's, it's funny because when I grew up, and I'm, I'm a nurse, and, and went to nursing school, and I worked away for so many years. Then I came back, and, and I opened an assisted living over on Middleburg Road. It was called Brookfield Manor. Uh, resident care. I, I never dreamed in all my years that I would ever own a business in Union Bridge. 
I never dreamed I would. I never dreamed I'd come back here. I thought when I went to nursing school, I'd probably move away. But I, my roots are on Bark Hill Road, and I, I own a house out there. But it, it's funny because now that I own the building that the soda fountain was in, there's many times I'm here at night when I close up and thinking about all those people who came through those doors and all the people who owned it. And, and Mr. Otis Devilbiss, who owned the soda fountain with his wife Lillian, and they owned the, the, the grocery store where we're sitting, where I'm sitting now. Um, it's just, it's just, it's just amazing because you, you don't think about it. My life is a full, full circle. You know, I grew up here, went away thinking I would never come back here to work. And I went away, was a nurse for years, worked for the state, covered five counties as a nurse in a program. And then I opened assisted living for 12 years. And then, you know, six years ago, I, uh, my partner and I, we bought the Buttersburg Inn. We opened it and, uh, and we're running it today and, and, and we're enjoying it. It's hard work. The economy is not so great right now, so people don't have a lot of money, but, but our good, loyal customers keep coming back. And, but it's, it's just strange how that happens, that I never fathomed that I would end up here. And if you'd have asked me 10 years ago, you're going to own a restaurant someday, even though I love to cook and I do the baking, and my grandmother taught me things in her kitchen, which was a wonderful experience, um, that I would end up here. It's just, it just it's kind of gives me the chill sometimes, because you just don't know how your life's going to turn out. But uh, I have to go back to my grandparents. They were good, loving Christian people. Um, my grandparents were Lutherans. And uh, I would go to their house. And you know, when we were kids, you would, my, my cousins who were older, they'd go out and help in the field with the chores. But I always stuck to the kitchen because it was cooler, even though it was hot cooking. And you would help my grandmother. And my grandmother, God love her, she used to say to me, now when they come in for lunch, we've got to hurry up and get them done because we've got my soap coming on at 2 o'clock. So we'd go in and see that I get to lay on the couch and snooze while she'd watch as the world turns. So that was, that was a good experience. So it's, it's been, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of memories. And I don't think as much about them, I don't think as, as what you have brought out of me, just talking about these things. But it's, um, it was a great childhood. I, I wished every child could have the childhoods that my, my nephews and my cousins and I uh, have had at my grandparents' farm. They were great people that uh, instilled hard work in us and values. And that's something that people need to keep doing. And that's what scares me about the kids today. They don't, they don't learn about the history and they don't have the grandparents sometimes that pass those things on. So it's been a joy.